got a shout out there, and uh, particularly the, kind of the point about that Elizabeth makes about complementarity and um, you know a different standard. Maybe if you could speak to that a little bit, that might be of interest. Sure. I mean, I don't really have that much to add uh, from Elizabeth's comprehensive overview, but I guess you know I, I think when we think about the standards um, in our set. <laughs> Um, it's, it's already significant to note that the, the, the 16 countries uh, have reached levels of commitments that go beyond the existing ASEAN Plus One FTAs. Now, if we add on um, other rules around e-commerce and you know, IP, even SOEs, um, then I think we are, we are trying to bridge that distance uh, that the CPTPP has set. Um, of course, I think it, you know, it will always be aspirational. They will never you know, be at the same level. But the fact that we get these countries talking about it um, is, is already a big step. Um, I should also add that it, it really drives momentum at the ASEAN platform uh, because the ASEAN countries will have to talk about what, what do we agree upon uh, when it comes to e-commerce and services liberalization. And it really, I mean, you know, um, Singapore was the chair last year in ASEAN and while we were disappointed that we weren't able to get the RCEP, uh, we did make significant headway in a lot of other areas. Uh, including finishing an ASEAN Trade and Services Agreement, which most significantly moved ASEAN from a positive list to a negative list. Um, that was uh, a great achievement. Uh, the ASEAN Economic Ministers also signed an e-commerce agreement uh, that also talks about rules around data, cross-border data flows, data localization. So, you know, I, I think when we talk about it as pathways, uh, all of us are sort of, you know, driving momentum and trying to reach a, a common goal. And, and that's really important. Well, you know, so we kind of started off with the, the kind of the smallest table in the room. We just talked about a slightly larger table. Let's talk about an even larger table, which is APEC. And Mateus Chile has uh, the, the, the chair this year. And maybe you could outline for us kind of a little bit of what, what, your, what the, the goals are and, and, and how you see it kind of interacting with some of the things that we've been discussing so far. Well, I would like first to make a clarification. I was a TPP negotiator on a national level, so I engage with private sector and civil society. I do this clarification because uh, the main focus of APEC, of President Piñera, is civil society. In fact, uh, we need that free trade impact and benefit for society, especially SMEs and, and women. And that's why our four priorities is, is digital society, integration 4.0, women, SMEs, and inclusive growth, and sustainable development. Um, these four priorities were not only discussed uh, within the 21 member of the economy, but also they were uh, directly uh, discussed put on the table uh, by President Piñera. Um, it's, it's important um, to, to be able that, especially women and SME, get included on, on free trade and get impacted as <coughs> for the main purpose of uh, avoiding uh, protections. One of the reasons of protection is and, and of civil society or protectionist movement is that they don't see the benefit that the free trend uh, has for them. So that's why, as a counter mover, I think we need to make FTA suitable for all the society. Well, I think that sounds like it's going to set up a, a, a pretty exciting year. And I think, you know, this isn't the venue, but certainly I think we're going to be looking forward to kind of. Some of the details of how we're going, you know, how how Chile plans and how the membership plans to, to make pro meaningful progress uh, in those four areas. Um, before we leave this topic, I just wanted to just close on with one issue, which is the chorus agreement, which um, yeah, just went into the it's been in effect for a while, but the revised, uh, enhanced. I'm not sure what the adjective we'd like to use. Uh, went into effect in, in January first uh, as well. Anku, any, any observations on that? Um, yes. Um, before I mention, you know, chorus, I just want to uh, quickly touch on the RCEP. Uh, when 
you know, Korea is part of the ASEAN process right now. And then I remember about a few years ago when PPP and RSEC negotiation were going on at the same time. I visited uh, Japan and then uh, talked with some of the business leaders over there. But uh, interestingly, uh, some of those business leaders were more interested in RCEP than TPP, which were kind of uh, uh, it's very interesting to me. So, because it uh, looks like, you know, the, with US market, you know, they have uh, uh, already uh, business uh, find their own way to do business with the US, but uh, the Chinese market is not accessible yet. Uh, so uh, I thought, you know, the, so the, that conversation made me think that uh, maybe RCEP could be, a, you know, really have a good impact on this Asia Pacific uh, in the region. Uh, because uh, if you look at this population, it's uh, the much bigger, uh, it's actually biggest uh, this trade area. And also, uh, this uh, the middle class is booming, and then also if you look at the average age of the population, it's a very very young population uh, in ASEAN country. And also, TPP only include you know couple of two or three you know, ASEAN countries, but ASEAN include all ASEAN. So uh, in terms of this uh, you know regional or global value chain, ASEAN could be uh, it's complete on its own. So. Although uh, the level of ambition is much lower than that of TPP, I think RCEP, if it is, uh, it is uh, concluded, especially this year, I think also it could have a big impact uh, on you know, the global trade as well as uh, trade in the region. And uh, in terms of uh, the Coros FTA, uh, actually Korea was uh, the first, con first major trading partner which concluded major trade deal with the, you know, the Trump administration. Um, I think the U.S. focus, well actually this course was different from NAFTA. You know, course was just only five years old, relatively new uh, trade deal, whereas NAFTA was about 20 plus something uh, years. Uh, but then U.S. wanted to you know, reopen and the U.S. focus was on actually automobile sector. Uh, and Korea's interest was in sort of a trade remedy and then uh, this investment state dispute settlement mechanism. So I think uh, we found a sort of a win-win solution. And then we are happy that uh, the process was rather quick and you know, less painful uh, to both countries. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's what I can say. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna ask you to hold on to the microphone too, because then let's move on to our, our second topic, which is to talk a little bit about the challenge that's presented to the region uh, as the U.S. and China work through their differences. Uh, you know, if we've been talking about sort of the, the affirmative, you know, approach where, you know, where you kind of trade liberalization by setting a good example, you know, the other part of trade, the trade regime is, you know, where you have issues and disputes. And so clearly that's kind of where um, China and the U.S. are right now. But uh, that obviously has a, a significant impact uh, uh, on the region, both in terms of economic, practical for firms, supply chain, um, at EY. Uh, we've done some surveys, you know, kind of taking the temperature of the business community. You know, do they expect the US China issue to be resolved uh, you know, quickly? You see a range of responses, um, you know, from some to, you know, <coughs> to several years to two months. So it's out there, it, it is a source of uncertainty. So the question I'd like to put to the panelists is, you know, how are your countries responding to that? How are you navigating? Because I think it's probably fair to say that both China and the United States are important trading partners uh, for all the countries on, on, on the panel today. So how are you uh, working through that? Hanku, why don't you, why don't you start us off? I think you know this. Uh, the U.S.-China trade tension is the biggest uh, concern and interest for all of us uh, here in, in this room. Um, I can make uh, two observations from you know the third party's point of view, uh, especially in the region. I think first uh, on the business side, I think uh, for example, you know, the Korea it has been. Uh, the biggest foreign investor in China for several years. 
and then actually tens of thousands of Korean companies invest in China and then uh, manufacture something, export to US or other countries. And then you know, some of them they bring back to Korea. So that has been sort of a business model for many Korean companies. Uh, but then what we are uh, witnessing right now is that some of those companies are looking for other options than China. Uh, because although we may uh, expect some kind of short-term deal uh, coming out of this ongoing uh, trade discussion, I think you know, those businesses realize that I mean, this kind of thing could happen any time. So I think uh, as a sort of a, to avert this risk, I think companies are looking for some other ASEAN uh, countries as a manufacturing basis, for example, Vietnam. As you may, as you may know, Samsung uh, has the biggest you know, mobile manufacturing base in Vietnam, and they are really, really doing well right now. So um, as a result, I think what this, uh, you know, this G2 trade tension um, implies to the region is that I think that could be an opportunity for other countries as well. I mean, so far, every, everything was concentrated on China uh, as far as manufacturing uh, is concerned. But I think this kind of trade tension seems to have some effect of sort of spreading out this manufacturing base or kind of a wealth base to <coughs> other countries in the region. So I think in the long term, uh, we have to see what would be the final outcome of this ongoing trade tension. And second is, on the government side, I think to many countries in Asia, uh, China and US are their number one or two trading partners. For example, to Korea, uh, China is number one trading partner, about 25% of our annual trade volume. The US is about half that size, about 13% of uh, our trade volume. And then, so I recently met the IMF economist, and he mentioned that if uh, Chinese uh, GDP uh, growth uh, decrease what, by 1%, um, a third of that uh, <coughs> affect Korea, you know, Korea GDP negatively. So, in some way, we are kind of uh, uh, very linked to China and uh, the US uh, as well. So, obviously, this tension is really taking a toll on some of our economy. Uh, so I think many uh, Asian countries, uh, what they are doing is that they try to diversify you know, this, uh, the risk by uh, starting new you know, FTA negotiation bilaterally or multilaterally, plurilaterally. I think CPTPP and RCEP are one of those efforts. For example, in Korea, um, we are negotiating with Mercosur countries. Uh, we finished, uh, we concluded uh, the negotiation with these five Central American countries. Uh, so uh, I believe that the other countries in Asia will not be exception uh, to this trend as well. Thank you. Well, uh, we live in an interconnected world. In fact, uh, China and the US is our, our first and second trading partner of Chile, so the situation on how evolved is paramount for Chile and <coughs> the structure of the trade system. And, and not only the trade system, but also the, structure, uh, is the prospect of, of global uh, growth, uh, impact on the price of commodity, um, in terms of exchange, uh, among other. And so, and I will come back to APEC. So that's why it's so important for us APEC this year. That's one of the things that we are doing as, as Chile is that we are counting on APEC as a non-binding terms that where countries and civil society and private sector can engage in meaningful conversation, but in a non-binding manner. So we are looking forward to create this environment where, where negotiators, where civil society can speak freely, that is very hard to do in the WTO, that probably we'll speak a little bit later on, and, and, and build a consensus, build a bridge, understand the other state, point of, of, of view. And, and, and that's why, for us, 
this year is so key on the tradition and, 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 and on the outcomes of, of Chile's priorities for it. You know, that's a, that's a really good point. I think I feel we're pretty lucky having Chile in, in the seat. It, you know, at such a pivotal uh, point in time, we made that uh, made those points. I think it really uh, speaks to some possibilities and, and and the kind of dialogue that we need to make sure that, that continues. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that all four of us uh, in this panel here are the physical embodiment of the grass that suffers when two elephants fight. Um, so I think it's no understatement that um, you know when the world's two largest economies get into a trade conflict, there are serious global consequences. Um, I think if I can speak to the consequences or, or the impact on U.S.-China trade tensions in ASEAN, um, I think that it's really too early to say if ASEAN will be a net beneficiary of, of a trade diversion or supply chain reconfiguration. Um, certainly from the uh, immediate standpoint, there are no winners. Um, you know, people have talked about the potential benefits of um, trade diversion and supply chain reconfigurations in the medium term. Um, and that, what that means is, you know, instead of importing more from the US and China, you import more from, from ASEAN, uh, you shift your production networks away from China uh, into the ASEAN countries. Um, I think from the data, it, uh, what, what is clear to us at least is that, you know, where there appears to be trade diversion, um, I think this is really a short term thing. Um, and it may not be sustained. Uh, Korea and Taiwan have certainly benefited, I think, as alternative suppliers to capital goods and intermediate goods uh, that have been targeted by the tariffs. Um, in Southeast Asia, we've seen Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam also uh, exporting more of US uh, tariff hit products, um, but these appear to be tapering off. Uh, when we think about supply chain reconfiguration, uh, you know, we hear stories coming up anecdotally uh, but we haven't really seen that uh, show up in the data. Um, if those of you who have read the MCHEM and uh, MCHEM China and MCHEM Shanghai reports recently, um, you know the the surveyed companies have said twenty percent of their surveyed companies have said that they are either relocating or thinking of relocating uh, their China-based manufacturing to Southeast Asia. Um, but I think the reality is that there are few countries that will provide the scale that China China provides. Um, and from a business standpoint, it doesn't make sense to move your production out of China if China is your end demand market. Um, so, you know, we've not seen a decisive pickup uh, in, in FDI flows into ASEAN. Uh, for the most part, it's really been wait and see. Um, and I think that actually, uh, that business uncertainty uh, is, is the thing that worries us the most. Um, um, you know, as much as we talk about trade diversion, I think the, the key thing is that it has already begun to erode business uncertainty, uh, erode business sentiment and dampen investment sentiment across the region. Uh, and to the extent that growth in China slows down as a result of the tariffs, I think we are likely to see uh, a far larger negative income effect on ASEAN than any positive substitution effects uh, as a result of trade diversion or supply chain changes. Um, the reality really is, is that China is the largest trading partner of every ASEAN country. Um, it has been the largest trading partner of Singapore since 2013. Uh, the US is, is, is our third largest. Um, we, are, we are one of the largest, uh, our companies invest uh, heavily in China, uh, even though uh, the US is the key um, uh, source of, of FDI into Singapore. So if you think about all of the interlinkages, um, you know, if we think about the possibilities of recoupling or, or moving supply chains, uh, that is far harder to do in reality uh, than the rhetoric suggests. Thanks, and really all of the remarks that have been made could be replicated for Australia. China is by far our largest trading partner. Our trading relationship, two-way trading relationship with China is two and a half times that of our two-way trading relationship with the US. But we also enjoy a significant trade surplus with China uh, of some 50 billion Australian dollars, or about 37 billion US dollars. Like everyone on the panel, I think it's fair to say that US-China trade tensions are really the key uh, problem that keeps us awake and busy at all hours of the day and night, and including in Canberra. And so it is for that reason that we welcome some positive signals of potential progress in trade negotiations between China and the US. 
We've always urged a negotiated outcome that is WTO consistent, that open markets, opens markets and is non-discriminatory. We hope that will be achieved. In terms of direct impacts, uh, Australian companies have been caught up in the tariff actions, those that produce in China, we're aware of. Um, but we've not really seen much trade diversion or Australian product replacing US product, partly because the commodities that we export, and they are principally commodities, are somewhat different from those that are exported by the US. Um, but I think the point that certainly Andrea and Hanku have made is really important, even if there are some short-term positive gains, the overall uncertain environment mitigates against those gains. And really what businesses look for is certainty, particularly in trading relationships, particularly when you're talking about long-term investments. Um, one thing that's probably a little bit harder to gauge is actually um, the less tangible or less easily measurable impacts such as investment decisions foregone because of the tensions. Um, we have some anecdotal uh, conversations with companies that were looking to invest in the US, have deferred those investment decisions because of US-China trade. So those sorts of um, very difficult to measure but real decisions can have an impact but it would be harder to see how they play out in the long term. But I think it's important to think about those impacts as well as the short-term gains. Well, I mean, I think the, the point that's made about uncertainty is absolutely correct. I mean, it's sort of the bane of investment and um, you know, planning for companies. Um, maybe this is, uh, so I guess the question is, so we have this problem, maybe this is a good point to transition to WTO and kind of the multilateral response. Um, and, you know, Elizabeth, I, I think Australia has just consistently been a, a, a leader uh, in, in, in the WTO. And, you know, I think, uh, the, I suppose it's not by mistake that this was the last topic. Uh, it's, you know, it, it doesn't get as much attention, certainly in the United States. And, um, you know, it's certainly at this point perceived as. <coughs> Uh, having some, you know, perhaps structural uh, you know, concerns that have been raised about some of the institution itself, its, its, its ability to kind of to cope with the kind of everything that we've sort of been talking about, both in terms of, you know, the conflicts, the, 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 the China-U.S. conflict, but also, you know, these other systems that are being put in place, the CPTPP, RCEP, uh, at some level those are, uh, and, and, you know, are, are challenges Why don't you uh, kind of what's what's the thinking in, in Australia? 